I think so. Just keep it cool. You know me? I'll meet you back here in the... Hey everyone, welcome to Boundary Break. So this camera was made by Evil Blunt and Three Socks, and there are some limitations to this tool. I can look around cutscenes, but it does make Arthur invisible. Just keep that in mind, everything else is pretty honky-dory. And being that this is a open world game, I love talking about developer techniques, because there's a lot that goes into making games like this to make it run smoothly. And those abominations that you saw at the start of the episode is the lowest level of detail that you can possibly put on an NPC model. Now to achieve this, I had to adjust the game's system files. But reducing it to the lowest settings will only give you the most primitive models that are available, when in fact, there are quite a few tiers of detail that can go into a character model. So we got the lowest level here, and we're gonna call that level one. That's the one we've been looking at for a while now. And then immediately, you'll already see level two, and you'll notice this because the character now has hats, accessories that you normally don't get to see until you reach this level. But at this stage, there is no eyeballs, the facial features are not properly attached to the face, and you may or may not get fingers depending on whether or not you have gloves. Then at level 3, things start to look a lot better. You have actual eyeballs, the facial hair is not in full detail, but at least it attaches to the face properly. But the finer details on the face are not loaded in yet. And then stuff like ties clipping into the body are still present, you can see that right there. And then we get to the final level where you can see the wrinkles and the eyes are properly inserted into sockets. It's a much better looking model. And here's a fun little fact, at stage 3, if a character is sitting on a park bench, or just sitting at all, for some reason the eyeballs bug out of the head. This is not a glitch, this is actually something that is implemented into the game. Just gonna give you multiple examples of this so you can kind of see that it's not an isolated incident. So I already know what you're thinking and don't worry I'm not going to show you anything inappropriate I promise. But we're going to take ourselves inside the bathtub to kind of show something that is important to know. Uh, apparently the model for the bathtub scene for Arthur is almost fully modeled. He does have a fully modeled butt that I'm not going to show you but he doesn't have anything going on in the front. But he does have fully modeled hairy legs so that's what I decided to show you. Also his wash rag is always stored inside of his right leg and the woman that can help him bathe seems to just love in. So don't expect her to come out of a room or anything quite like that, she's right outside the door when she finally spawns. And using the low poly models, I'll show you a couple of other things. For example, the low poly model of Arthur is also fully modeled, and he seems to have black triangles just below his nipple area, which is very unusual. As you can see here, the low poly model of Arthur also has a fully modeled butt, which I was very surprised by. And something I wanted to show you here with the woman that helps out Arthur, depending on where she reaches, she starts to hover like a witch. It's very, uh, well this whole scene it's just surreal imagery, isn't it? And while we are still kept on the subject of low poly models, I figured I'd show you one of the most common camps in the game at different levels of detail. So here's what it looks like normally. And then we have an option here within the camera settings to reduce the environment to the lowest level of detail as possible as well. So all you get left is a couple of caravans and a few tents. And none of that is even textured. And in case you wanted to see the inhabitants in their low poly forms as well, here's a quick little tour of all of them before we move on to the next scene. So I mentioned this in the last video and it really helped out a lot. So I'm just going to mention this one more time for those that missed it. Back in August, someone or something at YouTube drastically lowered the show's viewership overnight. And one of the weirdest things about this change is that about 50% of the views now come from subscribers as opposed to 10%. Which means that if you're watching this video right now and you're not subscribed, you kind of hit the YouTube viewer lottery. And it's incredibly unlikely right now that you'll be recommended another video again. But if you hit subscribe, it should increase your chances to about a 1 in 14 chance. Anyways, thanks for allowing me to share that with you. And with that said, let's get back to the show. Alright, so next up is Dev Cubes. This game is unapologetic about how many Dev Cubes there are underneath the map. Just about any area that you go to in the game, you'll find at least one within a viewable distance of whatever position you put yourself in. And here is a great example, right at the start of the game. That first cabin you visit with Dutch, that cabin has eight Dev Cubes underneath the map. As you can see in this one shot, it's clearly defined how many cubes there are. And while I can't tell you what each individual cube does, these cubes always pop up whenever a certain piece of unique code needs to be brought into the game. But amongst the many common cubes that you will find in this game, there is one that is wholly unique. It is one that is still labeled by the developers. This is the one underneath the sheriff's jail, and it reads IPL equals value 03 default jail. Makes you wish that all the other cubes were labeled by the developers, but unfortunately, that's not the case 
case, but we still have a hint as to how they communicate amongst themselves during the development process. So now I want to talk about some of the oddities in the game and maybe give you some information that might be a little interesting to you in a boundary break perspective. And the first one I want to talk about is a alien spaceship, because of course there's an alien spaceship in a Rockstar game. So there's a couple instances in which you can see this spaceship, but one of the easiest ways to do it is to go out to this shack here at 2 a.m. after reading a letter that's inside the shack, and then it'll appear for a very brief moment. Now taking the camera over to this thing will give you a much better idea of the details to this spaceship at the very least. There's nothing inside of it, but on top of it, there is a glowing dome shape, and on the edges of it are two circles paired together, and then wrapped all around that edge. The bottom has like a bit of a volcanic shape to it, you know, the typical stuff you see for abductions and sci-fi films and all that stuff. And at the base of that is a circular ring that is also glowing lights. I tried to use different filters so you guys could see these light sources at the best clarity possible, but of course, with how bright they are, it does kind of mask how these shapes are supposed to look. So hopefully for the most part, this gets the job done. And then there's the woman in the outhouse, and I just wanted to take the camera inside so you got a very, very good look at her. You can see that she seems to have no hair on the top of her head, and it seems that she's missing a portion of the top of her lip. It looks like her face also features some scars, and the inside of the outhouse seems to also have some scratches on the inside of the walls. Then there's the mysterious hill house, which I feel like is a reference to the Hobbit homes in Lord of the Rings. But of course, that's just speculation. Anyways, taking the camera inside the door frame will show you that there's a concave modeling that goes a bit deep, which again, this is not something that you really see in Red Dead Redemption. It tends to be that there's literally nothing on the opposite side of a door, or you're gonna have a fully modeled room. So the fact that the devs went through this amount of effort, it's, it's just unusual. It's unusual because you just don't see it anywhere else. I did, of course, take Arthur inside of there, but unfortunately it doesn't trigger an interior or a loading zone or anything quite like that. Okay, now let's talk about cutscenes. Now again, cutscenes were a little bit tough this time around because your main character disappears if you explore cutscenes. It's a bit unfortunate, but that doesn't mean I couldn't find some stuff. For the opening cutscene when John's child gets kidnapped, you can find a ton of T-Post models underneath the map. All these models get used a little bit later in the cutscene, but until then they're stored here. You can also find a bunch of T-Post models in the scene itself towards the end of the game. It's for a very brief moment, so we're gonna slow down the footage here. But since they're briefly off camera in this one angle, you can see them placed in their intended spots before the actors start to play. And in the same scene, although you never see her in the cutscene for some reason, Suzanne Grimshaw is still in the scene. She's just hidden in this corner over here. And then in this scene here, there's a woman that answers the door for Miss Linton. And the camera stays outside the house the entire time. And so what you're seeing here is animations that are completely unseen by the player. And I suppose for good reason, because the character that answers that door seems to walk down a set of stairs and then sit down. Now the mocap actress probably actually had to do that and step off a stage and so what you're seeing is probably an unintended animation and then there's this encounter with Mr. Cornwall. And as you can see, all four characters are in a straight line ready to go into the scene, which is really funny, but even funnier than that is that later on in the same cutscene, it seems that one of his goons is sitting as if maybe to be on a horse, but you can see that his arm is not looking quite right either. <laughs> I don't, it's hard to say exactly what this animation was intended for, but clearly you're never meant to see it. Okay, let's talk about a couple more developer techniques before we move on to another subject here. Whenever you go inside of a building, the entire outdoor environment disappears. This is because to save on resources, either the interior of buildings are called out or the entire exterior is called out while you're inside. But you might be thinking to yourselves, yeah, but I've looked out windows and I can see the outdoors. How do you explain that? Well, with calling, these objects don't disappear completely and the developers are using a technique here that's similar to how mirrors work in video games, except instead of reflecting an image, it's giving you a view of what it would look like outside. And then here's a funny little thing with the level of detail in trees. Now, once you get far enough away in the game, the trees get reduced to a cardboard cutout and those cardboard cutouts do not have a top view and so if you get to a certain distance and look straight down you'll see these trees having a horizontal approach towards the player you can even get them to twirl all right, now here's one that I like a lot as well. There's these light bulbs at the party in Saint Denis. And while I was exploring the map, I was like, oh, these look really good. I wonder if there's anything inside the 3D model. And I was actually wrong. These aren't 3D models. They're just cleverly disguised as one. Because unlike those trees, right? If you look at the bulbs from the side, they have an image for just the side of the bulb and it faces the player at all times. But then when you move the camera above it, you can see it transition into a different image. And in fact, if you place the camera in just the right angle, you can see both images at once destroying the illusion. 
So here's some various cool things. Right here we have the projection booth and there's actually a guy operating the projector and has unique animations as well as sliders that would be very difficult to see from the angles that you're able to look at them with. But more interesting than that is that there's a door to the projection booth that leads to nowhere. It's a phony door essentially. But on the opposite side of that door, there is a plaque that reads manager. And then there's the theater. I wanted to take the camera around and show you all the props and stuff that's hidden on each side of the stage, as well as what happens when the actors swap out between each performance. The showrunner never disappears, he is always somewhere on the stage, whereas the other performers seem to disappear and then reappear, they load in and out. And in that same theater room, we have this chandelier here. What's really cool is that if you take the camera through the ceiling that it's hanging from, the pole that it's suspended from continues onward, and at the very top of it, there's a detail to the model that can't be seen by the player, sporting a little diamond shape at the very end. And then there's a spittoon that's pretty much glitched out of existence. There would be no way for you to see this by normal means because normally, you couldn't even see beyond the lip to even see it in the first place. And even if you took the character up there, most of the time you can't see the spittoon. But for whatever reason, at certain angles it will appear, making this essentially an unused object due to a program error. And here's something a little bit weird. When you buy a ticket in the game, the cash that you hand over to the ticket booth gets stored normally like right in front of his pelvic area. But there's also extra coins stored inside of his pelvic area, which that's not the case for every merchant in this game. Like for example, this ticket booth at this completely different location has nothing inside of his pelvis. And in fact, it turns out that the money that you used to exchange for this service is always stored at the bottom of his feet. And then when it's handed to him, it's stored by his pelvic area like all the other merchants. Meaning the money's not technically on Arthur. It's always been at the ticket booth this whole time. Anyways, I think it's about time I finally show you a zoom out of this game. Now it's not the best because I couldn't get rid of the distance fog, but still, I think you might get a kick out of this. So at a certain point in the game, you visit an island called Gwarma, and it's awfully mysterious because you go to it at one point, and then when you get off of it, you never get to go back. Well, what's cool about Gwarma is that it is in fact connected to the main map. And where is it on the main map? It's technically south of Mexico. So although you're not allowed to reach Mexico in the game, which we'll get to later in this episode, if you were to continue all the way past Mexico, you would eventually reach Guarma. In fact, at certain portions of Guarma, you can see the terrain of Mexico intersect with it. So if that fast traveling visual didn't do much for you, I think this will just kind of put that cement in there. All right, got a little bit ahead of myself there. There's still a couple things more that I want to talk about that's just kind of hidden out of bounds. And the first thing that I want to talk about is the dressing room that's in one of the clothing shops. When you select an outfit, you get warped to a separate room where you try on the clothes and there isn't a door that you can just go in and out of in order to check it out. So where it is, is very appropriate. It's actually right on the other side of a door that would probably lead to the dressing room, but it's a separate entity. And so it doesn't normally load with the interior itself. But if you move the camera in certain positions, it will show up. And then there is that famous scene in Gwarma where you take down a battleship. And I just wanted to show you inside the battleship is its own dev cube as well as cannons. And what you would never be able to see. I'm just surprised that it's not a low poly model that just has something that resembles cannons with nothing on the inside. No, they are fully modeled cannons inside this beast. And then there's Mr. Bueller. You might remember that when you first meet him, he just kind of springs out of the hot air balloon. Well, what's cool about him being inside the hot air balloon is that he has an animation in which he's tying a sandbag, although it's not perfectly done and that's probably why you can't see it so well. It's just really interesting to see that there was an animation tied to this. Figured he'd just be a static model. All right, we got two segments left here. Why don't we talk about the world's edge? So let's answer a couple obvious questions. First, why don't we take a look at when the collision stops? And the best part about where the collision ends in Red Dead Redemption 2 is that you can physically see it. The textures become way less detailed and it draws a line in the sand, basically saying, you take one step further, you're falling out of the world. And that is exactly what we'll do. But then there's also a point where the landmass ends. And in Red Dead Redemption 2, it is a literal edge. It goes from land to straight down into the water. And if you were to follow these sides long enough, you could eventually find corners. And then you might be asking, well, I see that the water continues past the landmass. What if you keep going even further? Well, at a certain point, you just get a flash of white, which I could be wrong about, but it's possible that you just hit the bounding box of the game. And the only way to get rid of this blinding white light is to head back to the mainland. Let's talk about a couple of unused areas. Now, what's cool about this game is that it shares a couple of areas that were used in Red Dead Redemption 1, but not all the buildings and caves that were used in Red Dead Redemption 1 are fully accessible in 2. Over at Gap Tooth Ridge, there's a mine shaft that you can mostly explore, but at a certain point, it's barred off, unlike how it was in the first game. And so, taking the camera past that block, show you there's a lot more mine shaft to be explored, as if the assets were ported over. And at a certain point, you'll see that some of the mine shafts and some of the objects inside the mine shaft don't 
don't have any textures mapped to them. Also, by the way, over in the same area is a pile of bones. And once again, this is incredibly uncommon, but if you take the camera underneath the ground where these bones are, you can see low poly versions of those bones. Now I discovered those bones at night. So here's another clip showing those off at daytime as well. It's pretty weird that a low poly asset, especially for an object, is just stored underneath. Not sure if it's used in any way, honestly, even for level of detail. Anyways, moving on at the Armadillo Town, there were some buildings in the first game that you could go into that you could not in this one. And taking the camera in some of those buildings will show you untextured objects once again. Here you can see a schoolhouse with benches, a projection screen, <laughs> a random door, you know, a bookshelf, some crates and a broom and stuff like that. Some very average stuff. Just once again, you'd never have access to this building, so it's just interesting to look at. Oh yeah, also, here's the basement where Sadie was kept at the start of the game. Looks like this basement had a bunch of wooden logs and also a bucket with a box that had some bread in it. Possibly a potato. I'm gonna say, actually, they gave her a potato, not a piece of bread. All right, now with all that said, let me take you to Mexico. Mexico's really interesting, and I wish that I could just dedicate a whole episode to just exploring it because it's very clear that either there was imported assets from the first game or they meticulously recreated a lot of the areas of the first game to do a low poly equivalent for this game. Some details you would never be able to see no matter what angle you tried to look at this land at. For example, there's this train tunnel over here, which has no business being here. That cannot be made by mistake. And of course, there's stuff that you can see from the shoreline, and I just want to take the camera up close so you can get a good look at it. Here's a fort right here, and it does remain low poly even if you bring your character over. But it's really just cool to see the level of attention that the developers were willing to give to areas that you wouldn't even be able to explore. Hey, if you've been subscribed, thank you for your patience on this one. This is the longest I've ever spent making a Boundary Break episode. 160 hours collecting footage. Insane. Don't even feel like plugging anything this week. Just thank you. Thank you so much. And I promise the next video will come out a lot faster. To new viewers, thanks for giving me a chance. And to longtime subscribers, thank you so much for all your support.